My name's Paul Cockshot. I am the co-author of the book Towards a New Socialism. I wrote it with my friend Alan Cottrell, and we wrote it in response to a political situation in the 1980s where the Soviet Union was obviously getting into difficulties. And within Britain, pro-market ideas were spreading in the Labour Party. Particularly influential at that time was the professor of Soviet studies at Glasgow University who wrote a book advocating market socialism. He was an expert in the Soviet economy, so his arguments seemed convincing, and they certainly convinced the leadership of the Labour Party in Britain. But we thought we could refute those using ideas from modern computer science and also from classical political economy. And that's what our, our book was about. We're in the 21st century and people are starting to think again of the viability of socialism and it seems to me that there are now a number of people coming together and saying that there are three key ingredients to a viable socialism today. One of them is the replacement of money and prices with value-based economics, with economics based on labour time. The other is the use of the very much more advanced information technology we now have to make rational and detailed planning of the economy feasible in a way it wasn't before. And finally, the principle I think most modern socialists would advocate is the replacement of representative democracy with some form of participatory democracy to give the majority of the people real control over the disposition of national income. Now, the question as to why socialism would be preferred to capitalism can't be answered in the abstract or in general because not everyone is going to prefer it. Uh, who's going to prefer it is going to depend on whether they're rich or poor, basically. And the studies we've done of the distribution of income in Britain indicate that if an egalitarian system of payment was introduced, the overwhelming majority of the population would benefit. We calculated in the early 90s how much a person would get if an egalitarian system of payment was introduced. And the only section of the population which would lose out was the top 25% of men in office jobs. All manual workers, male or female, would win out. All, well, all quartiles of female workers would win out. And three quarters of male office workers would win out. And the, the people who'd lose out, obviously, are the, a small minority of the best paid people and an even smaller minority of people deriving their income from property. One of the points that Nove brought out in his book was the inability of the Soviet planners to plan in detail. Now, you can take uh, examples, I think Dobb cited this as well, they, they could set a plan for the number of pairs of trousers they were going to make, but they didn't necessarily get the right plan for the number of zips they were going to have for the pairs of trousers. So that you, you end up with trousers without zips or shoes without laces. Now, that kind of thing came from the fact that the plan targets were set in aggregate terms. The plan targets would be set for maybe a thousand different or a couple of thousand different categories of goods and they were set in money terms. They weren't set in terms of the actual physical products that were going to be made. Now, you contrast that with the, the system of product codes, which is was introduced in the capitalist world in the uh, 70s, the barcode system, 
that enables every single individual product to have a unique identification number. And the modern supermarkets have a feedback system whereby they know exactly how many of every product is being sold. And you need a planning system that goes right down to the product code level if it's going to be efficient. I've done experiments with a modest computer costing maybe £5,000, which our department has, and found I could solve the equations for an economy roughly the size of the Swedish economy in about two minutes. Um, if one had used the types of economists, uh, sorry, types of computers which the physics department here have or any weather forecasting centre has, then it would be a very easy matter to solve the, the equations. The remaining problem is the, the problem of, of obtaining the information, collecting the statistics. And that also is becoming a lot easier because when you think of it, every production facility nowadays uses computers for ordering its components. It uses computerized spreadsheets for calculating its costs. The data is already being entered into computers and into databases. And in many cases, users and suppliers share these databases already in the capitalist world. At the same time, companies like Google have developed the technology to, to send spiders across the web and concentrate enormous amounts of information in their servers. Were it the case that companies generated web pages containing the information about what they needed to produce each of their products, then that could easily be captured by uh, systems analogous to Google. And what stops it being done at the moment is obviously commercial secrecy. Companies don't want others to know what they're doing. But if we envisage a system of, of publicly owned enterprises, there's no reason why they shouldn't publish their, their resource requirements as web pages um, or by some appropriate submission system to a database and collect the data that's required for planning. The idea of using labour vouchers instead of money goes back a long way in socialist thought. The first person to propose it was Robert Owen, who proposed it in probably about the 1830s or so. And his idea was that you'd get rid of banknotes and people would be paid in labour notes. And if someone had worked, let's say, five hours during the day producing something, they would get labour notes denoted in, in five hours, and you could then go to a cooperative store and buy goods that had taken five hours to make. Now, if you did that, the, would, the, the middleman would have been cut out. There'd be no profit being made, either by the shop or by the employer, and therefore the main cause of exploitation would be got rid of in one stroke. Now, the, the idea was adopted also in one form or another by La Salle, Proudhon and Marx. All the 19th century socialist leaders advocated it. Another difference between labour vouchers and money, however, is that money can circulate between people, and that is the basis on which capitalist exploitation is based, employing people and then giving them back only half the value they produce. In order to prevent this, Owen's scheme was that these labour vouchers wouldn't circulate, they'd be cancelled out once people had handed them in to the cooperative store. They could only be used once. And therefore, you couldn't get a circulation of capital arising. Nowadays, you wouldn't necessarily have to do that with paper. You'd obviously use some kind of electronic accounting system, similar to credit cards. But the same principle applies. One of the problems that socialists always encounter is people saying that if you reduce income differentials, there'll be no incentives. Now, if you take this in the case of labour vouchers, you have to realize